Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the House of Hardcore podcast, Tommy Dreamer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the House of Hardcore podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Dreamer. And this week, oh, I have a guest. I don't even know who's going to speak to me. You know him as Dexter. I know him as Sam Shaw. And now the world knows him as Hatchet. Hello, sir. How are you? Doing well, Thomas. How are you? A uh, little, little intrigued about this interview. Didn't know if you'd speak. So thank you for speaking. You haven't said much in the last uh, few years. So uh, thank you. I always knew you were a weird character, how I sometimes had to outweird you. So I'd like to uh, ask you the question I ask everybody who does the House of Hardcore podcast, which I know you listen to and never remark at and just stare at. And then you take whatever your listening device and you beat it with your hatchet. What got you hooked into this wonderful world of professional wrestling? Man, it's it's crazy to delve into that uh, because there's so many things that intrigued me about wrestling but my go-to is always from a young age I was drawing pictures my mother says I was doing that at two years old uh just doodling and it looked like I was drawing what I saw on tv and what I watched on tv the most was pro wrestling and superman and batman and to me wrestling was like the real life version of those types of superheroes. So it was like, I would draw Batman, I would draw Superman, but I would draw Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. And my mother would do that for me. I'd be like, hey, can you draw that for me? And she wouldn't get like the belt right. So I would be like, that's not right. And then she would tell me, all right, you do it. So then I would just start drawing. She's like, wow, that's way better than mine. <laughs> so. I think just watching wrestling from a very young age and seeing the over the top characters, the whole Kogan's, uh, the ultimate warriors, the Rick Rudes. I was a big fan of Rick Rude because he had a mustache, just like my dad. And I just always felt like, I felt like I needed to have a mustache one day because that just looked cool to me. Could have watched the show Magnum P.I. and got that same effect, by the way. Sure, sure, sure. Been a world-famous actor. Yeah, very true. But for some reason, we love this line of work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you? So did you have a particular guy growing up? Like, So initially, it was the Hulk Hogan's. It was the Ultimate Warriors. It was those larger-than-life, just jacked up, look like superhero characters. So it was just kind of like, wow, that just, they look like real life superheroes. And I just said to myself from a very young age, I was like, I want to maybe emulate that. I want to do that. I want to be part of that line of work. And I want to look like that if I can, if I can. So you hit all your goals. I like it. <laughs> I, th I think I've done all right. You definitely have that Rick Rude mustache, your Rick Rude-esque physique. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you sometimes uh, clinch your butt cheeks in the mirror and then cut promos to everybody in your house? Funny you should say that because I just did a show out in Spokane, Washington, and I was wrestling Warhorse, and a young lady in the crowd just had to give her opinion and say that I had a tiny ass. Mm. So then that became, that's just one of those organic things. Like you weren't expecting that, but I was a little bit offended. So throughout the match, I was flexing my butt cheeks. Nice. That and was I, one thing that's never been yelled at me, by the way, <laughs> or told to me. Um, then did you immediately, because we're all crazy wrestlers say, I have to go home and do squats. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's exactly what I, I'm like working on my glutes like more than ever lately. I'll show that crazed woman. <laughs> so how do you uh, go about becoming a professional wrestler? Well, I would go to all the WWF house shows uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando. I would frequent some indie shows and I was just trying to figure out, this was at a very young age, like parents would take me or um, I would go with my brother and because we wanted to be a tag team. My brother and I wanted to be uh, a tag team and he sort of grew up and I didn't. And uh, so I would go to all these shows and I'd just be like, oh, this is cool. Like, I think I want to do this, but I'll tell you this. And I've told you this many times. I'll tell the world now, but it was not until I went to an ECW show in Jacksonville, Florida at the Morocco Shrine Temple. Uh, that was the night that I, I watched that show. I was very close to the action and I just felt like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. The, the uh, energy of the crowd, uh, the way the, the wrestlers fed off that energy. And I'll, I remember so many things about that night that just made me want to become, it sealed the deal for me. It was the nail in the coffin. I watched you and Dusty Rhodes versus Steve Carino and Jack Victory. And then Sandman came out at the very end and the crowd went just absolutely ballistic. And you guys brawled all over the building. It was a Jacksonville street fight. I've never seen a Jacksonville street fight like that before, but you guys brawled right near us. You may have gotten some blood on the floor right next nice. to me and maybe on my shoe. You smelled it. <laughs> I may have, but that was it. I went home that night just on this, like this high, this natural high that I'd never felt before. And I was like, why didn't I get that when I went to WWF raw and saw the rock come out, you know, some of that stuff gave me, you know, the goosebumps, but attending that ECW show and just feeling that energy is what sealed it for me. That's, I have to do this. Well, I love it because, and I can relate to it. And I'm sure I told you this, I got that same feeling when I saw Dusty Rhodes and Bugsy McGraw wrestle Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch in the Hollywood Sportatorium. And I literally, once that match was over, turned to my dad and said, this is what I have to do for my life. So I'm glad that you got double dose of, uh, you got Dreamer and Dusty Rhodes. And I also fit that over the top muscular superhero that you always wanted to be. So, I mean, every box checked right there. Well, of course. I mean, if I can put you over, it's, I mean, you, that crowd was just ecstatic for you. You know, they, you and Dusty, they were just like, you had them in the palm of your hand. And yeah. it was just, how did these guys do that? And it's just, I wanted to do that. Well, you did and you have, and we'll get to that. Um, so now, how old are you, by the way, <clears throat> at this time? I'm talking <laughs> when you get to see this larger than life, overly muscular character named Tommy Dreamer. And, so, uh, yeah, I was, I think I was 16 years old. I don't think I had my license quite yet because my dad just dropped us off and, uh, we get, we get in line and it says like 18 and up, you know, my brother was like 14, but <clears throat> he let us in and yeah, we didn't care. Yeah. Sam ain't probably fed you beer. <laughs> um, so how do you go about being a pro wrestler? So immediately when I got home that night, I started just like <laughs> going online and researching wrestling schools and, you know, I was in high school and, you know, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do after high school. And my parents really wanted me to go to art school and just get a degree and, you know, focus on that. And then I would have my mother's complete 100% full blessing to go be a wrestler, try and be a wrestler. So 
So basically when I finished college, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and I started training with Curtis Hughes at WWA four. I don't know what that means. I don't know what WWA four means to this day, but that's what was plastered on the, the door of the wrestling school that was right next to a strip club called club wax. Ooh. Yes, sir. Interesting. Was, uh, I, I will go ahead and admit it was probably one of the worst areas of Atlanta. Uh, I got my truck broken into a couple times. The door handle was broken. I had to get in through the passenger side because of me parking at the wrestling school every night. Wow. Uh, that would also stand for Worldwide Wrestling Alliance for the, come on now. <laughs> That's been highly debated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Mr. Hughes is training you, and then you, uh, how do you make your way back to, well, because I know where I first met you and all that stuff, so. So I did a, about a year there, and uh, man, I learned a lot. It was uh, five nights a, a week. It was just get in the ring with somebody, and Mr. Hughes is just calling stuff, and he's just, you know, I'm not learning, and I've talked to him about this before. I don't feel like I learned the psychology, but I learned all the moves. He was an excellent trainer the execution of all the moves and where to place them and things like that. But the psychology of a match and the stories you want to tell, I felt like there was something missing. So I felt like I almost got the most out of what I could there and uh, love Mr. Hughes to death. But I spent about a year there. We traveled up and down the roads and did indie shows. And I went to Memphis wrestling and worked with Corey Macklin and Jerry Lawler. And they would always use me on TV matches. And I got some good experience. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I could execute moves nicely and take bumps and uh, was still constructing a worthy physique at the time. So I just knew it was going to take a lot of time, but you know, we're still part of that microwave generation. So it was just, like, I want more. I want it. I want it now. So I just felt like I needed to get out of there and go somewhere else. And I found team 3d Academy in Kissimmee, Florida. And I had maybe 300 bucks to my name. And I just told my mom, Hey, I'm going to Kissimmee, Florida. I don't know where I'm going to live. I'm just going to figure it out. And I get to the school and I do an evaluation with Bubba Ray Dudley. And $250. <laughs> so there's, I have $50 left, no place to stay, you know, but I just was so committed. I was like, I don't care. It seemed like Bubba hated me right away, but I was going to prove to him that I could be something in this business and not just him, but myself, you know, I, I didn't care like if he hated me or not, but it's, I knew that was the place I needed to go because it was going to get me ready for how hard this business is. And in retrospect, it, man, I wouldn't take back anything that happened to me at that school the training, the lectures, the Bubba pulling me in the office and telling me like, you know, you messed up many times, but I wouldn't take any of that back to, you know. Well, it is cool that you learned the, the business and yes, you learned bumps one way you learned from one person. Then you did learn different psychology from Bubba and Devon. Um, I, I kind of, as knowing Bubba as long as I have, I, he's very, very business orientated. And then I started really now as he's getting older, he's realizing like, he, cause I tell him all the time, like, do you realize like how you've contributed to the wrestling business or like, you know, these are kind of like your kids, you train them. And he's like, eh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the big answer. Um, so and it wasn't until Camille versus Kai Lin where he started like getting emotional 
we almost made him cry um, on Busted Open. But like, or even when we had Camille on the dais at uh, WrestleMania and he like, he started breaking up a little bit. So hopefully we're trying to, I'm trying to break that hard chisel. I don't know if it could ever happen, but I sometimes feel the same way how you feel. And I got him in the business. So yeah. Well, blessed because that's where I get to meet you for the first time. And we did kind of hit it off uh, from day one. And then, weird. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm plottingly weird to pop people. And you're just weird, but also like to do things to pop me back. So then um, Bubba starts bringing you and other students to TNA. And is this kind of like your first break in the business? I would say so. Um, I was working at Universal for a third party company doing caricatures. Like you sit down in front of me and I draw you kind of funny. And I would do that all day. And I would have my gear in my car in the parking lot because I knew at any moment, if I didn't have my phone on me, that Bubba could call me and be like, hey, get your ass over here. And my boss, he knew that. So he would just allow me like, hey, you can leave your post, go do what you got to do at the soundstage for TNA and then, you know, come back if you want or just go home. So I had a really good little gig going with that. And it allowed me just to be very close just in case. And uh, yeah, I think I did an indie show in Sanford, Florida, and I worked with you yes. for the first time. I think you put the bell on my crotch and you hit it with the, the little hammer. Yep. And uh, we still joke about that to this day. Um, but I think it was like maybe just a couple of weeks later, Bubba pulls me in the office and he's like, hey, we have this hardcore justice pay-per-view coming up. And Tommy Dreamer wants you to do a spot in the match. He wants you to hit that big leg drop from the top. The only catch is you're going to uh, play the role of a guy we had in ECW back in the day named Lupus. Yes. And he had a blow up sex doll. And I, I think you guys supplied me with one, but it was like one tenth the size. It was like the tiniest blow up doll I've ever seen. Correct. Uh, but hell, I was so pumped and excited. I remember my roommate and I were just like, this is it, man. This is, you made it, blah, blah, blah. And I think I during that- you wanting to do it in thumbtacks all the time. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not having you leg drop a bunch of thumbtacks. I mean, I just don't think we've ever seen anybody do a leg drop from the top and land on thumbtacks. And I was like, you could get them all in your balls, up your butthole. And you're like, I don't care. I want to do this. I would have done anything. I know. And now, uh, let me ask you this, because I remember it specifically. Were we, was I on the wrong side for how you have to drop your leg? I think so. <laughs> but I adjusted. And it's just, I don't know if I have that body control like I did back then now, but. I don't, I don't think I killed you with it or anything, but. No. But I remember once it was applied, I was like, shit, I think this is the wrong leg. And, <laughs> but. I mean, you I, had a lot going on in that match, so I don't blame you. It's had a lot going on that whole day, but. Yeah, uh, there was so much going on. Whether you're driving an old classic or a real piece of junk, the car market is hot. And that's why I want to tell you about rockauto.com, the one-stop shop for all auto parts you need to keep your car on the road and in pristine condition. Rockauto.com has been in business for over 20 years. They have every part you need in stock at amazing prices. No reason to run around to different stores, websites, or auto shops. Rock Auto has what you need in stock right now. And guess what? Rockauto.com prices are always reliably low. That means they do not change prices based on what's going on in the market. This isn't like an airplane ticket, a hotel, or beef at the grocery store. You won't need to constantly check to see what you need is available. And if now is the best time to buy, Rock Auto keeps it simple 
and has everything in stock at reliably low prices. So go to rockauto.com. They make it easy to maintain your car and save money. It feels good knowing your car is in top condition. Once more, rockauto.com for great prices on auto parts and tell them we sent you. There's a box when you check out to put in the name of our show, House of Hardcore Podcast. The prices are too good for promo codes. Now let's get back into it. So from there, how do you get kind of recognized within TNA? So I think it was just me being around a lot and they would stick me in dark matches. And I think Dixie developed, like, I think she, she saw something in me. She liked me. And I think Eric Bischoff was around by the time I got hired there. I did the gut check thing where I had, I had a dark match with Doug Williams two weeks prior and it was just, eh, it was just okay. And I was like, Oh shit, I think I blew it, you know, but then I get a call and they're like, Hey, we want to use you for gut check. And I think the two or three past people that they used for gut check, they had said yes to. So I went into it with the mindset, like they need a no. So I think they're like, Oh, we can use this guy. And he won't shine and we'll just, it'll be a good TV segment where we can say no. So that was the mindset that I had. I was like, I'm going to prove them wrong. So I went out, had this match with Doug and man, anytime I see Doug Williams, I always thank him because he's the one that I feel like put me in a good position to get a job. Um, he bumped his ass off for me and made me look like a million bucks it was a very short match and it parlayed into to another story they had. But I remember just getting to the back and Eric Bischoff is right there. And he's just, he just looks at me and he's like, shit. And I was like, what? And he's like, you did fantastic. That was amazing. And I, I thought I was in trouble at first, but, and then I see Dixie and she's just like, that was awesome. And then we had to do the segment where I had to do the, you get a live mic and you cut a promo in front of Taz and Bruce Pritchard and Al Snow. And I had nothing planned. I just, I just remember Taz, like his promos in ECW, how intense they were and how he always called himself the Bush league shooter. And I mentioned that in the promo. And I just think that, Bruce Pritchard and Taz and even Al, like they, they were like, this kid has something. So I got the yes, I got the deal. And then Al Snow tells me like, all right, you're going to go to Louisville for however long and go to our developmental system. So I was like, I had like just got my first apartment with my girlfriend at the time in Jacksonville. And now they're telling me, Hey, you got to go to Louisville. But I was like, let's go. You don't need a girlfriend. You're fine. Exactly. Pro wrestling. <laughs> leave everything. So you then you go to Louisville? Yep. Why don't I remember this? Uh, how long are you in Louisville? I was there about 10, 11 months. And I always say it, it was a strange... I've always been in like wrestling companies when there's always some transitional thing yeah. happening within the company. So I just feel like what happened with that whole thing was they were trying to have some sort of developmental system like WWE had where they could, you know, have some homegrown talent or send some guys there and when they need them, just bring them to TV or whatever. So I had a great experience in Louisville, like learning from, so many different coaches and uh, doing so many house shows like regularly, like working consistently, like three, four nights a week, plus training. Um, it was your life was just total pro wrestling and no distractions, really. But were you getting paid, by the way? <laughs> I was getting paid thirteen hundred dollars a month. And that was it. 
they didn't cover any moving expenses, which, you know, I get it. Um, it was just sign of the times, I guess, but I, I would have taken it for less. Of course. Just cause I was hungry, eager to prove myself and make it in this line of work. So whatever I had to do, I knew it was going to be a grind. I knew it was going to be difficult, but Hey, I made it work. How um, were you able to substitute by getting a part-time job? I had no time. Right. Um, I even heard that a Dixie Carter said that maybe you should get a part-time job. <laughs> but um, I think if she knew the schedule we were under, I don't think that that would have been realistic. But I did do freelance artwork, and that's where it really started for me to uh, you know, people would contact me and I would do commission work for uh, like people would ask me to draw the Legion of Doom and I'd charge $200 and send that off to them. So I, you know, that's when things started like getting a little better for me, you know, when I had the two sources of income. Of course. Um, so now you get called up to the main roster, I guess we could call it that. So they had a mass firing spree out of nowhere. They'd fired like 15 people and my name was on the list. Apparently <laughs> um, I was getting, I got like 20 text messages saying, Oh, I'm sorry, man. Sorry to hear that. And then Al Snow calls me and he's like, Hey, you're not released. I don't know why this is being reported, but we fixed it. You're not being released. Um, John Guborik is going to give you a call. So he gives me a call and he just tells me, Hey, big transition happening. Um, we let go of a lot of people. I have an idea for you, but just sit tight for the next month or two and we'll be in touch. So I was like, okay, cool. So then it comes time. I get a call and they say, Hey, we need you in, Oklahoma for TV. So I go to TV and I'm going to do a dark match with Frankie Kazarian. And at the time I was doing this like skater esque surfer guy, extreme sports type of character, the off the wall, Sam Shaw type. I don't know. It, it resembled a lot of who I was growing up because I did all those kind of extreme sports and whatnot. But, uh, now I wasn't dead set on it or anything, but John Gaborik pulls me in a room and he just says, Hey, have you seen the movie American psycho? And I was like, with Christian Bale, hell yeah, it's great. Love it. I'm a big like horror movie slasher film freak. So right away I was like, is that what you want me to do? Because I will nail it. I will kill someone. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll get to some of those details later, but uh, <laughs> I was so pumped to just have something so tangible and something that I just, why didn't I think of that like on my own before, but maybe John Gaborik looked at me and he was like, this guy looks like a psycho. <clears throat> so some of that real life aspect, maybe <laughs> um I am a big fan of that genre, so I feel like I was ready to approach it and full on, let's let's do it. I had no idea what they wanted to do, but I was like, I went and got a haircut. I got the attire and I just sort of made it my own thing. And I've been doing that ever since. And I just feel like it's come a long way. At big time. Um, different versions of you. I always saw how unique you were <clears throat> for my vision. Like it was like, yes, you were an excellent bumper. Um, always had a good body, good wrestler. And then like the, the first time I ever saw you um, walking on your hands and like dragging your dead legs, like the dog on, I believe it's a uh, family guy. Yeah. Um, I was just like, man, I love it. And you like smelling things and being weird and creepy uh, we would always joke about a lot of stuff uh, behind the scenes with each other, but man, that character was so, so unique. So now you're, you did a lot and got a lot more experience in TNA 
And then it wasn't like your contract up or, and then you wanted, of course, we all want more money and they don't have it. And then you kind of let me go out on my own and then you get hooked up with NXT. Yeah. So I, I was just pitching ideas to TNA left and right. Cause it's like, I just felt like, man, I started out so hot in that company and got a good little run some good feuds with, with a few, you know, top guys, but then they had so many new people coming in and it's, that's always like the fear is like somebody else coming in. Like that's a spot. Yep. They only have so much time on a TV show to fit everybody in. So I was just kind of sitting at home for four or five months just pitching ideas. And I, I live close to Orlando, so I would go to TV every now and then and just show my face and just talk to them about ideas. And they always seemed like, oh yeah, cool. And then I would see maybe one or two of my ideas being used for somebody else. <laughs> so I was just like, okay. Um, and then I just get a call from John Gaborik one day and he just said, hey man, I just, we're just going to let you go. I was like, okay, cool. And went out, did some indie stuff. And I was really just contemplating on, man, maybe I've, it just seemed to stall out a little bit. Like there wasn't much going on. I thought that I had some good, um, the stuff that I did in, in TNA, I thought that that would make another company interested. And I did, I got a tryout at the performance center a couple months later, and I thought I just nailed it. Um, had a great tryout or whatever. And then Canyon Seaman just told me that just not right now. And we stayed in touch for the next, whatever, three, four years. He told me, just email him like every six months and let's just see where we're at. And then 2018, I just get an email from him and I'm, he just said, hey, I think you're going to be included in this next class um, to start at the Performance Center in January, or February 2019. And I was just like, holy shit, I made it. Great. Let's go. But there was like this shift and Triple H and Shawn Michaels were sort of in charge of NXT and they were bringing in a lot of people regardless of age. So I feel like that's one of the things in this business that's in installed in your brain early on is like, hey, this is a young man's business. You know, it seems that WWE has really gone that route again but it's so cyclical. Like, I don't feel like it's totally a lost cause now. Maybe go back one day. I don't know. What a great time in the industry. I mean, it sucked for me with House of Hardcore because anyone I would use, they would just hire. And then, yep. <laughs> but anybody who was available that had a little bit of, I guess, cachet would get signed to NXT wwe you become hot on the indies and then they just pluck you away but it i'm also thinking about this is in <clears throat> kind of retrospect for what you're talking about so you've had mr U's, bubba divon i've always had an interest in you al's had an interest in you um hunter sean think of all these people like that have seen your talent and this is also just me more talking to you and like seeing something in you and then I say, with all that experience, well, you should also, even though you're still young for this industry, start either producing, because I know you have a brain, and you also think differently, and just trying to do other things while also wrestling. That's all I've ever done since I'm in my 20s. Like that show that you came to, I was probably running the entire show and then wrestling in the main event. Yep. And it's all these different hats that you wear that keeps you having longevity in the industry. Sure. So that's just one. But I mean, think of all those talented people um, 
that saw something in you. I think that's really frigging cool to how talented you really, really are. And I've always seen it. I love your stuff. And, um, but I think it's, uh, I, as I get older, I think about stuff, but the more you're talking, I'm like, Jesus, think of that. Like you have one hell of a resume behind you and not for the stuff that you've done in the ring, but for all these people who just like, this kid has something. And now you're a man. Cause I'm seriously also looking at you. I remember your baby face and I'm, and I remember, man, his body's lean muscle, but he's going to fill out one day. And I'm looking at a friggin', I'm looking at a Rick rude type of man, you know, <laughs> but I've seen you grow up in this industry from wrestling with you, being your friend, receiving stupid texts from Robbie E and yourself, like that we get grouped into. Um, but it's something that you definitely should uh, look into because like I said, man, there's, there's a lot and, and your attitude is great, dude. I went back to the WWE 2016 to feud with the Wyatts. I was 45 years old and doing all the crazy bumps. I did the most bumps out of everybody in that entire thing. And I didn't even work there. Um, so yes, that's a great mindset to have because you got over big time in NXT. You were, I had to cover it on busted open. You were my favorite things to watch and to cover. And like that storyline, um, you not talking, you and Johnny Gargano, you and, uh, Indy, that whole wedding that when you finally spoke, like the, everything you did there was frigging gold. And I think both of us kind of saw the writing on the wall when it was coming towards an end. But like, I was, I would go on the air all the time and be like him and you and Johnny Gargano are the next Brian Danielson and Kane. And you had that reaction to the people. You had that larger than life superstar reaction when you'd come out and your, you know, your work always backed it up. So, I mean, <clears throat> and think of how much better you are to be in that system. That's exactly what I was just thinking about as you were talking. It's a uh, man, three plus years at that place really did so much for me. And it's, it's afforded me the luxury of being able to go out to a Spokane, Washington, and get a nice payday and be received by those fans like I was something special. Like they remember those moments and the way I presented my character. I can't tell you how many people just came up and were like, your stuff was just so different and your approach and you're, you're always staying in character and this and that. That means so much to me that I was able to, you know, do that and give that reaction, you know, to the, to the fans. And if you think about it, I mean, there was times you were on TV every single week. Yeah. And also your appearance where you would show up or you're lurking behind a corner, all this stuff, or even the build between you and Indy, how you're hooking up and you're also doing it without speaking. That's sure. a unique ability that, you know, most people can't get over. Because how do, you know, how do I tell somebody I like them? How do I, you evoked a different type of emotion each and every week without speaking. It's like silent movie shit. Um, and then if you also really think about like full circle, you now <clears throat> evoke those emotions that you spoke so highly about with me and Dusty, you do that to other people. You did that because I was... I witnessed it live on television all the time, but like from the wedding or for when you and Johnny were tagging, it was like that type of euphoria, especially in front of that crowd, you know, and you're kind of a hometown talent, which most people don't realize that you're kind of from that area, but you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, but it's really, really, I think it's that these are things that I really enjoy about our business and uh, professional wrestling. Um, tell me, because Robbie always would text us about, I don't, I remember it, but I don't remember it. You pinned me and I licked your armpit. <laughs> it's like, we were texting about it and I just, uh, you know, my wife was like, how come you never told me that Tommy licked your armpit? Like never, you never put that over. And I was like, 
probably because that's just a normal occurrence when I see Tommy Dreamer, you know, <laughs> just, you never know what's. And then did you beat me down with a chair? And I was like, why are you hitting me so hard? Your friend. I think it was, uh, we were in what Clarksville, Tennessee. And I think your elbow was like yes. up here and I hit you with a plastic chair and I injured you. Yep. Thank you. And then Robbie was like, why are you so stiff? Like that's become the running joke. Like no one wants to work with me because I'm so stiff. Yeah, you took out my elbow and then you pinned me and I licked your armpit while you were pinning me. That's true. After a nice 15 minute match. You taste good, <laughs> taste salty. I wanted to get big like you. What was uh, your favorite moment in NXT? Man, I got to go with the wedding. Just because to me, that was just like, it seems like in our, our business, especially these days, it's like every match is like, let's have a banger of a match. And that's been like, that seemingly is what the fans are always expecting. And that's what they want. They want a banger of a match. They want two, you know, great wrestlers to just have a great match. And we got a main event spot, 10 minutes, of a wedding that went totally right. There was no yeah. <laughs> thwarting the wedding. There was no swerve. It just, it went off and it was a happy thing, you know, but there was so much, you know, craziness, shenanigans happening within that 10 minutes and told so many stories. And Indy Hartwell like is so good at just off the cuff, reactions and her timing on saying you know saying things at the right time johnny gargano is great at that as well candace larray with her facial expressions throughout the wedding me flashing the hatchet was just uh, it just it lived on it's a, it's like a a meme and a a, a gif <laughs> um that's just something i'm very proud of um, one, one day, one night I had a match with Damian Priest and it was main event on TV one night and, and Hunter came up to me after the match and he was like, great job. And I just asked him, I was like, are you comfortable putting me in that position like more often? And he's like, dude, you've proven that you are an attraction here. And if we need you to step up and be in a main event you're a guy we can rely on and him telling me that I was an attraction, you know, and that's all that's always been in the back of my mind. Like that's so cool to be an attraction. And like, if you're not on TV for a few weeks and then you, people somewhat forget about you and then you just pop up out of nowhere, that's like the coolest stuff to me. even the stuff like boogeyman back in the day, like yeah. you would just show up. And That's proverbial what it's called, special attraction. Exactly. And, uh, you know, just just reminiscing with you here, but it's just those are things that, you know, I think back on very fondly. Um, had a great relationship with Shawn Michaels and Triple H, and I owe those guys a lot. And we still text to this day. And uh, I have good, just great relationships with those guys. And I learned so much from them. It's insane. Again, another, another thing that just made that three plus years at NXT, like, you know, such a useful thing for me, you know? Right. They're two of the best in the industry. How could you not learn from them? Absolutely. The, the in-between stuff, like when you're not necessarily working, Sean was just always like, we just sit there and watch tape with you and just be like, Hey, right here, you should be moving. You should be doing something. Even if it feels awkward, like do something here. And once I started applying those things and he saw that, like he, you know, I feel like that's when he started being like, you know, Samuel Shaw can, you can put him anywhere. Right. Uh, you know, I always wanted to be that, either an attraction or somebody you can rely on. I love this line of work. I love this business. 
and I don't see me getting away from it. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm Ever. 51. Keep going. Yeah. Um, just keep going till you die. That's how you're supposed to do. And then I'll, if I'm wrestling you, I'll pull you on top of me. So you get a victory. Um, and you also do artwork for fans, other people that uh, you commission. How can people find you on socials as well as do get your art? So on IG, it's Samuel Shaw underscore official. Um, and if you want, if you're interested in artwork, just DM me. My DMs are open. And I do have a bit of a, a list going. I have some commission work that I'm currently working on. I'm working on a Jim Cornette painting right now. Uh, I did a Vince McMahon painting like right before I was released. I saw that one. You sent it to me. <laughs> I did a little video just to say thank you for my time in WWE. And I sort of used that painting as like a centerpiece for it. And then I wound up getting a really great offer on it and sent that out i've sent artwork out to australia and all different places and it's going really well um, whenever i do conventions or appearances i always bring prints of my artwork so people can enjoy my artwork when they meet me and purchase a piece so when you do your characters you do that quickly too um depends the paintings the paintings tend to take a little longer because it's right. a big canvas and pro wrestling tees commissioned me to do a couple giant paintings where it was like hey do 30 wrestlers like i want a ring like right in the middle right. and then all the wrestlers jumping around do, doing their signature stuff and those took a really long time but so worth it once they're done they look great so, and they're hanging up at the Pro Wrestling Tees office in Chicago, so. Is art relaxing for you? It is. Yeah. I used it, to love to draw up until uh, faces. I would always have problems with faces. I could do bodies, but then I would do faces. I have to find a lot. And of course, all I ever drew was drawings. I drew, one of my best drawings was Sting and Eddie Gilbert, but because Eddie had so much facial hair and Sting had sunglasses, so I could do that and Sting had face paint so i could get away with that you got to find that i need to see that uh, man i guarantee you my mom still has my artwork <laughs> but i actually used to like to draw um, but i don't have any time my mom's an artist and uh i do feel you kind of it's a trait passed back down to you um <clears throat> so uh and how does anyone find you on social medias so you already gave your ig or the gram as the kids say yeah, and I'm on Twitter too. I think it's the same thing. <laughs> I don't free. I don't go on Twitter as much as I go on Instagram. Um, I'm working on a website as well to sort of showcase my art stuff a little bit more. So stay tuned for that. Awesome. Well, I thank you for your time. I know you got to go work out and get swole. Er, and uh, my my. Uh... My brain's always working. I already thought of a spot for you uh, in what I'm doing. So uh, I know I will see you again one day in person, not just on Zoom or stupid texts. <laughs> Hopefully see you soon. You got it, bud. And thank you for uh, being on this week's episode of the House of Hardcore podcast. And I appreciate you all for listening. And that's this week's episode. Hatchet.